This week, a rare personal warning of religious bigotry from a Supreme Court justice. Two school superintendents go to great lengths to get their way politically and run afoul of the law in the process. And a former Baptist-affiliated college cancels a drag event on campus after our reporter broke the story. These stories and much more coming up this week on The Lion Week in Review. Welcome into this week's edition of The Lion Week in Review. It's a weekly look at the culture, the courts, the state capitol, and your kids. I'm Chris Stigall. Now let's meet our panel today, some of the men and women behind the stories at ReadLion.com. Michael Ryan is our executive editor, Josh Mann, the managing editor, and Liam Siegler is a Herzog Foundation ambassador and contributor to The Lion. Welcome to all of you gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you. Good to be here. So today we start with a follow-up to our last show in which we talked about uh, a Baptist college, or at least it was founded as a Baptist college, Josh, uh, <laughs> implementing a, uh, I'll say, somewhat controversial program on campus. It's changed direction after your reporting. That's right. So um, there was a student group called the Gender Inclusivity and Feminism Team, or GIFT, and they were set to host a drag-themed event uh, last Friday, and they had invited two uh, local drag performers who are affiliated with the Sisters of Perpetual Indulgence. And this is a group that basically caricatures Catholic nuns in drag and um, mocks Christianity. A lot of groups uh, find them, uh, you know, quite offensive. We heard about them during the Dodgers kerfuffle, right. is that right? The Dodgers wanted them to. Yeah, the same group, the national chapter, was to set to be honored at a Dodgers game, and there was a huge backlash. They were invited, the invitation was rescinded, then they were re-invited, and um, so two local uh, drag performers who are affiliated with the group were invited to go over to William Jewell College, which is near Kansas City, and to perform, um, and they were also going to teach how to do makeup and some other things, drag bingo, so this was basically one of these uh, drag-themed events. And after our reporting, uh, there was some uh, resistance online or just some opposition. People were letting the school know they were opposed to it. And in the end, the school uh, advised the group not to host the event. They cited concerns of safety, but uh, to date, we have not heard anything specific on that front. So this was a school-sanctioned event, Michael, as you understand it, or just something a club was doing and the school caught wind? Well, it was certainly a, a school-tolerated uh, event until they didn't tolerate it. Um, you know, and, and the drag workshop is spelled W-E-R-K for, I guess, for twerking, <laughs> which we all know what that is. <laughs> you, know, I, you know, first there was Bud Light, then there was Target, and now we've got Doritos. And Doritos just had to fire a Spain spokesperson for tweets. This was a, a trans person. Uh, for Doritos, who in the past had tweeted things about doing, quote, depraved things, in their own words, to a 12-year-old, and who also tweeted, quote, in the middle of the street, in Mallorca, in panties, and screaming that I'm a nymphomaniac in front of a super beautiful 8-year-old girl. And this is the person they had to fire. I'm, I'm just wondering... When are businesses and universities going to wake up to what's going on and the revulsion that's coming with it? You know, a part of the uh, rationale for this event that was canceled was inclusivity, right? Well, what about religious people? What about including them? Yeah, Liam, is this just uh, editorial question? Is this just provocation and being provocative for the sake of being provocative? Uh, this is not, you know, the marketing decisions or these club decisions can't be really speaking to those large, <laughs> that larger population. See, I don't think they have that on mind. I think they're actually, they think that they're providing an actual good. If, really? like you read, if you read the student group gift, they say that they're for sex positivity, they're for breaking down stereotypes. Um, but if, <laughs> it's just really interesting that this happens at a Baptist school <laughs> where like they're not only making a mockery of the Catholic faith by inviting that group that specifically targets Catholic nuns, but they're making a mockery of like the long-standing Protestant tradition of like having a sexual ethic that says that marriage is between a man and a woman, and not even that that like that premarital sex is is sinful that 
sex as something that should be between a husband and a wife. They're making a mockery of those beliefs too. Um, but it, just knowing what's going on with a lot of my peers, like they think that they're doing a positive good. Wow. Um, well, nationally, uh, I think this nun, uh, drag nun group has in the past done pole dancing on a crucifix, which uh, I don't think, see that as a public good. Wow. <laughs> Um, and the list of stories this week continues to be just weird. Uh, I'll just classify it as weird, Michael Ryan. Um, I, I'll, I'll read the headline. Outrage over teen toe-sucking at an event billed uh, as a school charity for disabled people. Michael, help. Oh, I, I wish I could. I wish I could. Um, well, my question is, what if they had been, say, washing the feet of yeah. these people? No, we're not going to do that. That's just too b- biblical. Uh, the Oklahoma State Superintendent actually had to announce toe licking will not be allowed in Oklahoma schools. <laughs> oh, now, there's grief. one PA announcement you never thought you'd hear. <laughs> um, I, I appreciate what Riley Gaines uh, tweeted out. She said, what kind of a nation are we living in where this even has to be said? Jesus can't return soon enough. Specifically disabled. I mean, it's just the, the, the layers of odd in this story, Josh Mann. Yeah, so the school district was doing a student kind of a student-led fundraising event, and, and the students raised money different ways. And But one of the events was this group of apparently high schoolers who um, may have come up with the idea. We don't really know whose idea was it, but in any case... The school district did end up coming out with a statement that said um, they they failed to to uphold the dignity of the students um, who you were think? licking <laughs> peanut butter off of each other's feet. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, the organization, though, that benefited from this fundraiser, so every year the students pick um, an organization to give the money to, they raised $153,000. This is no small amount of money. This went to a... Um, to a coffee shop called uh, Not Your Average Joe's Coffee, which uh, one of its main purposes is actually to hire and employ special needs people. So what seems like a great nonprofit um, found itself in the crossfire, the cultural crossfire, and receiving comments and complaints. How could you take this money? And potentially... People didn't know the whole story because the the video is particularly shocking. But I think even the fact that there was this uproar, the the video went viral, and the state superintendent has to comment on it, tells you uh, something about the current state of education in America. Yeah, and it seems to be operating, Liam, unabated, un policed, unmonitored. That's what's sort of interesting. A lot of these stories, it kind of reminds me of the stories of the teacher lap dances and things like that. They're kind of cousins. You know, administrators are kind of shocked to find out later what's going on under their own roof. Yeah, and it's just so unfortunate because the victims of things like this are people who are just trying to do good things for their community. Like the coffee shop, they do a lot of really good work. Like you look on their website, they have like six different locations. They employ people with mental and physical disabilities um, who otherwise wouldn't get that type of job. Um, They're a not-for-profit, and now they're caught in this crossfire and getting a ton of negative reviews over something that they had no responsibility over that just some kids put together in the public school. Whoever was supervising it didn't. They weren't doing their due diligence. Inmates running the asylum, Michael. Yeah, um, and, you know, everybody has stupid ideas, right? Sure. And at some point in your life, you develop a mechanism in your brain that says, no, 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 that was a stupid idea, don't do it. (laughs) For men, it's usually after 35, right? Uh, But when you're an adolescent or a child, there's usually, or in the past, there's been an adult there to say, no, not so much. The... um running theme of the last couple of stories, it's interesting, you know, Liam mentioned, Josh, uh, sort of the assault on the traditional family, the traditional values, people of faith. Uh, this is something that you've covered at the Lion. Justice Alito is warning about out there. Yeah, this was a somewhat rare statement because essentially the Supreme Court agreed not to hear a- an appeal uh, in regard to a discrimination case. And it is actually a Missouri Department of Corrections case where um, a lesbian employee was fired, and 
the, the Supreme Court said we're, we're not going to hear the appeal. Alito agreed with that, but he wanted – he was really concerned that this decision could be used to target religious Americans. Hmm. And so it's a little bit technical. Why, why does he make this statement? But um, to, to, I'll try to boil it down. He is concerned that the lower court's reasoning, he says, may spread and be a foretaste of things to come. He says, um, so what happened were two jurors in the case were, uh, were declined or were rejected because of their beliefs, their traditional views of marriage. And so what uh, Justice Alito's argument is that, well, if people with, if basically Christians with traditional Christian views, if we say, well, you can't be a juror on a, on a case involving certain people, then all of a sudden we have a precedent potentially to discriminate against Christians. And uh, he says the danger that he anticipated in a, in a previous case is that Americans who do not hide their adherence to traditional religious beliefs about homosexual contact, conduct will be labeled as bigots and treated as such by the government. So it's a, a stark warning, and it, it's a little bit technical, but I think there's something there that the justice is saying, look, America, and especially Christians, you need to watch out for this. So in other words, I'm in a jury pool, Michael Ryan, and they ask me my religious affiliation. I tell them I'm a Baptist. And they say, we don't want you anywhere involved in this story because of the defendant's sexuality, perhaps? Is that I what think, we're talking think, about? Yeah, I think that's what Alito is concerned about. You know, I bet, Chris, you thought that this was settled by JFK's election as a Catholic uh, president yeah. in 1960, but no. You know, cabinet members and judicial nominees of conservative presidents are repeatedly questioned during their nomination process about their faith and about whether they can even do their jobs uh, because of their faith. The New Yorker warned in 2020 about the extremist Catholic uh, Bill Barr. Uh, NPR warned that, quote, if Amy Coney Barrett is confirmed as a new Supreme Court justice, she will be one of six Catholics on the bench. Hide your children. <laughs> uh, in 2019, ACLU actually wanted a formal probe after Secretary of State Pompeo gave what they said was, quote, for all intents and purposes, a Christian sermon, end quote. Now religious jurors uh, need not apply, apparently. Yeah, freedom of religion, not freedom from religion. Right, Liam? Mm -hmm. That's the point. Yeah, and it, it's, it was interesting how this particular case happened because the attorney that was asking the jurors about their beliefs, it was just incredibly dishonest. He, he asked them, he conflated two things. He said, do you believe that homosexuality is a sin and do you believe that LGBTQ people should have rights? And unfortunately, because the, the framing was dishonest, both of them said, no, I, like, yes, I do think that it's a sin. And that was perceived as also saying that they shouldn't have any legal rights in the court system. And just like the dishonest framing, uh, attacking like spe their specific religious beliefs as if that disqualifies them from being able to judge their peers fairly. Um, I mean, this is something that, I mean, like you said, it was, it's inevitably going to happen. And it's, it's good that we're being aware of it now and being proactive and calling it out. Another story at uh, readlion.com, Michael, is uh, about a Texas school district. It is not a shock this day and age that uh, politics uh, is, is growing by leaps and bounds in school districts, in school boards. Uh, I know you guys also wrote a similar story about uh, uh, teachers' unions and giving to state legislatures, which is another interesting read at readlion.com. But tell us, Michael, specifically about this in Texas. Um, I'm sorry, which case are we talking about? We're talking about the Texas school district facing electioneering allegations. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well. Uh, or I could I just, would, we could. Yeah, we no, could. no, no, that's fine. I, I, I had a different one uh, that I wanted to talk about, but we'll talk about what you want to talk about. <laughs> um, yeah, allegedly the superintendent uh, told uh, the staff, quote, and if we don't support these those 16 representatives in the upcoming election, we will roll into the next session almost assured that we're going to face a universal voucher bill that will change the face of public education for years, heaven forbid. Yeah. Uh, so he promises to send the staff 
a list of 16 legislators to vote for to get what they want. And the problem with that is, and I hope people understand this, is that public bodies and officials cannot be browbeating either the public or their colleagues on how to vote. I mean, that's third world stuff. Yeah. Josh Mann, this is, um, are we going to see more of this as the battle for the direction of our schools and educating our kids uh, continues? Yeah, I think every indication says, yes, it will continue. And in fact, in Texas now, I think the count might be up to six, uh, to five school districts who are um, being sued or at least facing these electioneering allegations. And, you know, Texas is when the legislature rejected the school choice bill, uh, Governor Abbott promised to support the primary efforts against the incumbent Republicans who rejected his priority. Hmm. And there's a huge effort. And there's, because there's a huge amount of support for school choice among parents and among voters in Texas. And so I think... Uh, the bureaucracy, the administrators, and the teachers' unions know that universal school choice is very likely going to happen. There's a huge amount of support. There's going to be a lot of incumbents primaried. And so it's you can see that they're a little bit afraid because they're willing to tow this line and even cross it, it seems, uh, in order to try to get the votes they need. You know, I've mm-hmm. always said that it seems to me if you're a school board member— I would think your focus would be we're not interested in going after the competition. We're interested in improving our district so that no one would want to leave it. Liam, that seems to be what I would want to do if I were a school board member. Let's make this <laughs> district so great the kids don't want to leave it. Right. Yeah. <clears throat> and it it just seems that they're getting desperate. And, it, they're, and unfortunately, there's a lot of propaganda that even public school – uh, leaders and officials are buying into like the the pool of money that would be given to ESAs that would be given to private uh, families for private schools is a separate fund than the money that is going into the public school Texas public school system so there's just like a lot of there's a lot of misinformation and it's unfortunate that we've come to this like electioneering is a desperate ploy to try uh, just to change the tide of things. And yeah. if you look at the 21 Republicans who voted down the ESA bill last year, five of them have retired and 16 of them are up for re-election. So they, there's definitely an era of desperation that's happening right now. Yeah. yeah, and it's important to pay attention to, again, the story that you guys covered at Readline.com, if I remember reading this, Michael, that um, <laughs> Republicans are starting to quietly get donations from teachers' unions to, you know, get your mind right on votes like this in the future. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And But, but you know, back to the, the superintendent in this case, if, if he did what he's alleged to have done, it's not just unacceptable. It's a crime. Yeah. I mean, to be electioneering that way. Josh, man, the, um, st- there was another story. I don't, I, I don't mean to throw you a curveball, but I had happened to read at readline.com. Uh, Nebraska is going through something similar right now. Are they not? Yeah, so uh, the voters are going to have uh, a ballot decision in November. Uh, there was a big effort. They passed a similar uh, tax credit-based school choice program as Missouri has and a few other states. This is a very – it's a very modest program. It has a pretty low cap. It's not a lot of money. They finally got it passed, um, and I say finally in, in because the bill's sponsor had tried for multiple years, and so that's kind of – from her perspective, it had taken a long time. And uh, there was a big effort from teachers' unions and some others to repeal it, to get it on the ballot in order to repeal it. And so they've been successful. Uh, they've got the signatures, in essence, to put it, put it on the ballot. So voters in Nebraska could possibly repeal the law that st- starts this little bitty school choice program that helps mostly low-income students. Um, Framed as taking money away from public schools. That's the way that it's framed. And so um, pro-school choice Nebraskans would, uh, you know, have to pay close attention to the ballot language to be sure that they're voting, you know, the way that they want on that. But that will be on the ballot in November. And could I just get your opinions down the line very quickly? Michael Ryan, I'll start with you. Uh, Do you think if voters in just a straight-up yes-no vote do you think most voters in most states would say, yes, we support school choice, or no, based on your understanding where we stand right now culturally? Well, I think so, 
But it w- a lot would depend on the run up to the vote, and the way it's framed. The way well, but the way it's framed, the way it's advertised by both sides. Um, and, you know, but I, it, the polls show that this is a wildly popular and growingly popular idea, education freedom. But, Liam, the money heavily uh, behind teachers' unions who oppose it, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, I mean, I think they know that public opinion's against them. If you look at polling in most of the states where ESAs are popular, you have like 60 to 80 percent of people like school choice legislation. And there's a reason why Nebraskans. Uh, we're able to get that through the legislature. Uh, so I would say I'd be reasonably confident that they would strike down um, that, that ballot proposal. Um, but the problem is, and I liken it to what happened in Kansas a couple of years ago with the abortion regulation uh, constitutional amendment, voters were asked whether the legislature should have the power to enact legislation uh, that would restrict abortion in any way, which they already have, but the Supreme Court has ruled maybe they don't have that power. And Kansas is not a pro-choice state, but that went down in flames. Mm-hmm. And you know, So voters in a pro-life state, for some reason, said, we don't want to give the legislature any power to regulate it. Is it a lack of organization on the pro-school choice movement, Josh, meaning that there is just not the money and the organized messaging that the opposition has? Is that the problem for the pro-school choice side? I think it can be, um, and I think I think you're right. The, the, the other side has so much money. I mean, public education, if you just think about it in terms of money, and, and there's so much money in it. I mean, most states spend half their budget on public education, and... And we've talked about this before, but I think it's worth repeating. All the smaller districts are going to be the largest employers in their communities. And so when you think about a town and the money and the people and some of the good things that, you know, sure. come with that. Community. I think, exactly. Yeah. Um, I think there's a lot of fear. Well, will this – what if the teachers' union's right? Now, I do think that you – we can look at states who've had school choice – and you can, there's a lot of good evidence that says, no, uh, rural districts need not fear. This, you're not, there won't be a mass exodus. And as you indicated earlier, if, if you do a good job in your school, um, you're going to retain most of your students. And every superintendent with children surely knows that not all of their children learn the same way. Not all of their children are equally helped by this teacher or this class or this style. And so I think if we're just honest with ourselves as Americans where, you know, the free market reigns, surely we'll be open to this simple idea that children should have, or families should have multiple options. You mentioned superintendent. That's our final story today is a Washington superintendent. Similarly, boy, these school boards and superintendents out there are getting in all (laughs) kinds of trouble. Liam, uh, what can you tell us about this superintendent? What did he do? Oh, sure. Uh, Well, let's see. Uh, The superintendent uh, was caught stealing signs uh, (laughs) that were (laughs) in the middle of the night. Um, Superintendent. Yeah, I I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, but there's a campaign to build like new elementary schools. Yeah, a capital bond measure. Yeah, there's a capital bond measure. Uh, the, The vote didn't pass, but the people who were for the campaign uh, we're wondering why are all our signs disappearing, and so they started to set up cameras, um, just videotaping, and they and, and they put some gr- they put like, grease on the signs um, <laughs> to be able to like track down whoever was taking them, and and they found like in the back of this person's truck, like there was some grease that wow. was like the same type that they put on the signs, and then eventually like the video evidence, they were able to be like, okay, it's this person. Um, the yeah, superintendent, pretty... <laughs> job. superintendent uh, Lauren Evans, uh, and in fact, she's been charged with a misdemeanor, but recently got a diversion agreement, which will allow the charges to be dismissed if she pays for the signs. What strikes me is that, um, so, you know, this group was opposing the bond measure. They didn't want their taxes to go up. They didn't support it. The superintendent, who, uh, you know, Probably does, does support, support it. it. Yeah. Is going out in the cloak of darkness <laughs> to do this, and 
<laughs> and I, and ingenious, they put up trail cameras. It's amazing. And they catch a woman fitting her description. And then, as you say, he put grease on the signs, <laughs> and they found the grease in her truck and on her clothing. <laughs> and then here she sits in a courtroom. <laughs> She's a superintendent of a school district. Stunning, Michael Ryan. That's commitment, though. You got to give her an A for effort. Well, and and you got to give the people who caught her uh, some credit too. I yes. mean, it was like uh, trying to catch a nocturnal animal with this <laughs> photography. Um, but this is this is let's get to the bottom line. It's election interference. Yes. I mean, we we've been talking about election interference since uh, 2020 in this country. There need to be serious penalties for it. I'm not sure about mm-hmm. diversion, and you have to wonder what kind of role model this is for kids, um, and. Certainly the community is up in arms about it, talking to the school board. One adult said, your primary duty is to the, is to the students of the district, not the superintendent. Your secondary duty is to the taxpayers of the district, not to the superintendent. And one of the students adds, you have lost the community trust and are losing our trust. Yeah, and you're starting to see communities mm-hmm. not just rubber stamping whatever a district asks for in a vote these days, and that's mm-hmm. making a lot of school districts and obviously superintendents angry. Well, before we wrap up, I always like to go through the panel and ask them each their favorite story of the week at readlion.com. And Michael Ryan, we start with you. Yeah, mine is one that we're working on now and will be up soon. It's about top Kansas City elected officials and appointed officials underneath them doing a video for National Reading Day, which was last Saturday, March 2nd. And it, they're reading a book for children called Introducing Teddy, and it's about accepting and even encouraging gender transition. And that just happens to be the book they chose for National Reading Day. <sighs> Liam. Um, yeah, I wrote a story this past week about uh, – Lake and Riley's family and how they've responded to her tragic murder. Um, Lake and Riley was killed by an illegal immigrant um, just while she was jogging. And it is a tragic loss to the family, to the community, to Lake and Riley's friends. Um, and they recently held a memorial service for her. Uh, but at the center of the story is the faith of Riley's family, which is just really rem- remarkable. Like you see them and um, you, well, you just see the the community rallying behind them, and, yeah. and you see just their faith in Christ as the thing that's rooting them in the time of that would prompt so many people to despair and into a place of just um, just a really dark place. Yeah. And um, we've seen over two hundred thousand dollars raised for the Riley family, and they're putting it towards a trust wow. um, that's going to raise awareness about homicide. Um, and I don't know, it's just really remarkable what's happening after just what, what it was intended for evil is now turning into something like redemptive. Yes. A light in a dark time. Mm -hmm. Josh Mann. I'll second that. Um, this was one of the stories that, uh, stuck out to me, uh, that we've recently published. And I do think when you, it's, it's a pattern you see when you observe Christians who grieve, you observe this kind of faith and resiliency that I think those who are not have trouble understanding, but I think it also is a, is a, is a witness to the hope that Christians have, and so I think it's powerful. Mm-hmm. It sure is, and uh, that's the kind of great content you'll get at readline.com each and every day, every single week. So that'll do it for us this week. Be sure to keep up to date on all the latest news every day at readlion.com. For all of us at The Lion, thanks for downloading the show. We'll see you next time.